The Senate Agriculture Committee looked at cattle industry markets, including the rise in beef prices, a lack of market competition, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the industry. This is two and a half hours. Good afternoon. I call this hearing of the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry to order. Uh, a couple of notes. There is a vote scheduled for 3 o'clock. We'll proceed and just ask members to uh, go vote and uh, come back if you've not yet asked your questions. And also, I'm told that uh, the only ones that control turning on the mics are ourselves in this system. Staff can't do that, so please... Uh, push talk when you want to talk and then turn it off unless you want everybody else to hear what you're saying after you talked. So, um, so thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank members of the committee on both sides of the aisle who have requested that we have this important hearing. Uh, we're going to focus specifically on our cattle markets today. Many of us have heard from producers concerned with the lack of transparency and competition. These farmers and ranchers also raise concerns about concentration in the packing industry, potential market manipulations, lack of access to small and mid-sized plants, and a range of other issues. This is a really important conversation as the committee considers reauthorization of the Livestock Mandatory Reporting Act and as we oversee implementation of the $4 billion in funding to strengthen the food supply chain that I authored in the American Rescue Plan. USDA announced a broad outline for using those funds earlier this month, which will include supporting new and expanded regional processing capacity. Just this week, USDA also announced a new grant program to help small processors upgrade their plants to meet federal inspection standards that would help smaller processors boost their capacity and meet increased demand while providing more opportunities for small and mid-sized livestock producers nationwide, and certainly I'm looking forward to that in Michigan. Still, we have work to do. Several of our committee members have introduced proposals to address these issues, uh, issues of transparency, competition, processing capacity, and I look forward to discussing these proposals and working with colleagues as we move forward. Above all, we need to talk about how to make our food supply more resilient. The pandemic made clear how really important this is. Early last year, shifts in demand forced producers to plow under crops and dump milk. At the same time, consumers panicked at empty store shelves and food banks faced lines of waiting cars a mile long. Compounding this disaster was the failure of many meat processors to adequately protect their workers from COVID-19, resulting in tens of thousands of cases and hundreds of deaths. These outbreaks caused plants to shudder and forced many producers to euthanize animals they couldn't get to market. The price livestock producers received plummeted while consumer prices surged. In an effort to stabilize the market, Congress stepped in to provide assistance for workers and producers. Cattle producers in particular received $6.45 billion to offset losses. And just last week, Secretary Vilsack announced resources to keep employees safe with pandemic response and safety grants. However, these are only help mitigate some of the effects Many of the vulnerabilities exposed by the pandemic still exist. 
We were reminded of that in May when a ransomware attack froze all of Brazilian-owned JBS's Northern American processing. One attack on one company halted one-fifth of U.S. meat processing capacity. And the issue was only resolved, according to reports, after JBS paid $11 million in ransom. Concentration and consolidation clearly play a large role in many issues affecting the industry. For example, USDA's Packers and Stockyards Division data show that four companies account for 85 percent of fed cattle slaughter, with fewer companies and more foreign-owned companies controlling more of the marketplace. There is a widening gap between those giant players and the small and medium-sized processors that many local farmers and ranchers count on. So what happens when farmers and ranchers have fewer options? What are the immediate effects? And what are the unintended consequences? Those are the questions I hope we can begin to answer today. I'd now like to turn to my friend, Ranking Member Bozeman for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for setting the stage for this afternoon's hearing. The topic we are here to learn more about is <clears throat> so very important to a number of senators, both on and off this committee. The U.S. cattle industry has a storied history. It is the backbone of many rural economies and represents the largest segment of agriculture in many parts of the country. Many success stories are associated with the industry's as it's carved out its place in the world's most sustainable producer of high-quality beef. <clears throat> in 2019, 14% of the beef produced in the U.S. was exported, generating $8.1 billion in value. By comparison, in 1990, only 4% of the beef produced in the U.S. was exported. Correlating with this growth in exports is the increased quality of beef produced in the U.S. today. <clears throat> Nearly 85 percent of the beef produced in the U.S. is gra grading prime or choice. In 2007, only about 50 percent of our beef earned these grades. This improvement in quality is due to producers making investments in their herds, in genetics, management, and feeding practices to produce higher quality and more diverse products for the global consumer base. These investments are being made across every segment of this complex and interconnected industry, from the cow-calf producer to the backgrounder, packer, and further processor to provide the wholesaler, retailer, exporter, and ultimately the consumer a growing variety of nutritious beef products. While this industry is diverse and modernizing in numerous ways, the nature of the beef cycle dictates that the industry is slow to adapt, adapt even the most immediate changes. The rib I am having for dinner tonight was derived from a steer that was conceived over two and a half years ago. While changes can be made in the cattle industry overnight, the effects of those changes may not be realized for years. And when any one segment of this industry experiences an unexpected event, like the fire at the beef plant in Holcomb, Kansas in 2019, it ripples through the entire supply chain. When every segment of the cattle industry experienced the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, that ripple effect was amplified in a manner that has been unmatched throughout modern history. Though we are moving beyond the havoc wreaked by COVID-19, new challenges are now confronting uh, this industry. A worsening drought in the West that is creeping into the plains, increasing input costs, severe labor shortages that are limiting utilization of packing capacity, supply chain challenges at our ports that have been worsening for months, and the threat of regulatory overreach. The past two years have been some of the most difficult this sector has ever experienced. Mounting frustration is resulting in calls for widespread reform of the cattle industry due to these difficulties. We must carefully consider reforms in response to the exceptional black swan events that have occurred since 2019 and the consequences both intended and unintended of such actions. An increasing number of producers are marking their cattle through alternative agreements to manage risk and buffer themselves from market volatility while also capturing gains 
for the value-added investment made to their herd. Yet we're hearing questions about whether current market conditions allow for adequate price discovery for fed cattle and the effect that a thinning cash market could be having throughout the supply chain. I'm interested in hearing perspectives from our stakeholders on these topics and for the committee to gain a better understanding of the impacts of proposed reforms on beef producers, processors, marketers, and consumers. I thank all of our witnesses for their, I thank all of our witnesses for their participation in this important hearing and helping this committee learn about this multifaceted industry and the unique challenges that it faces. Madam Chair, I have received several letters and written testimony from cattle producers and stakeholder groups who are interested in today's hearing. I request unanimous consent to include these documents for the record. Without objection. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to turn, to, uh, we will introduce all of our witnesses. I'll turn first to Senator Thune for our first introduction. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to, uh, to you and to Ranking Member uh, Bozeman for having this hearing. We are here today because we need answers. Uh, we have cattle producers who produce the highest quality beef in the world, and they deserve to be able to participate in a marketplace that operates fairly, transparently, and with integrity. And so I'm delighted that you have uh, called this hearing. I look forward to hearing from all our witnesses, but I in particular want to recognize a uh, panelist who is here from my home state of South Dakota, and I want to welcome to the committee Mr. Justin Tupper from St. Ange, South Dakota. And uh, Justin is a cow-calf producer uh, who also serves as vice president of the United States Cattlemen's Association. In addition to his cow-calf operation, Justin manages the St. Ange Livestock Auction, which holds sheep sales every Thursday and cattle sales every Friday. And I have been there on a few of those Fridays for those cattle sales. Justin, thank you for being here today. I look forward to your testimony and input about how we can improve the situation for cattle producers in our state. Um, and uh, Madam Chair, uh, with your indulgence, Justin, uh, before you begin your testimony, I'm guessing some members of this committee have never, maybe never been to a sale barn. Uh, since you are an auctioneer, would you mind demonstrating for members of this committee what they would hear if they were there on a sale day at the St. Uh, sale Barn? Well, sure. Thank you, uh, Senator Thune. And with that, uh, the, I don't know that we could get him in this room, but if we had a uh, fat steer, we'd ask a dollar twenty. And now one. I ain't anybody to give twenty-one two. I ain't anybody to give two three four. I ain't anybody to give four five. And hope we get to two dollars. That's where we're trying to head. So, <laughs> thank you, Senator Thune. I love it. You know, <laughs> thank my, you, Justin. Thank my you, experience is at many 4-H livestock auctions more than. Uh, probably where, where you were, but uh, uh, I've heard that many times. And when I was bidding, they always bid me up. They always watched what I was doing, and I always ended up paying higher than anybody else. So, but it's wonderful. It's wonderful to have you here. And thank you, Senator Thune, for that uh, example. Uh, we now have uh, our next two witnesses uh, are going to be introduced by Senator Marshall. We have two people from Kansas. You would almost think that Pat Roberts was still chairing the committee. But, he, uh, but uh, Senator Marshall. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and please bow your head when you say the name Pat Roberts here today. But I certainly am pleased to see several Kansans participating as witnesses in today's hearing. And it's certainly an honor to, to introduce two of them. First is my good friend, Mr. Mark Gardner, a fifth-generation Kansas farmer. The Gardner family is one of five families that traveled in a caravan of covered wagons to the Ashland, Kansas area in 1885. His ancestors lived in a dugout on the harsh prairie on their homestead land, incidentally, just some 70 miles from where my grandmother lived in a, my great-grandmother lived in a dugout subsisting on jackrabbits and biscuits. Sticking with that pioneer spirit, Mark, his father Henry, and the gardener Angus Farm are some of the key architects of value-based marketing in the beef industry that pays cattle producers for the quality of their cattle. In 1997, Mark became a founding member of U.S. Premium Beef and today is the last remaining uh, original board member. The gardeners and many of their friends and neighbors persevered through great adversity in 2017 when almost the entire ranch was consumed by the largest wildfire in Kansas history. The Starbuck fire burned more than 450,000 acres in Kansas after burning nearly 200,000 acres in Oklahoma. 
Mark and his wife Ava lost their home while the ranch lost hundreds of cattle to the fire and hundreds more had to be euthanized. But the miracle, only one human life, was lost. And the aid that came from across the nation to help ranchers certainly was the most outpouring of love and hope I've ever personally witnessed. Now, unfortunately, Mark can't be here today. Evidently, he had a disagreement with his horse, and the horse won. But Mark, I want to thank you for being here and look forward to your perspective. The second individual I had the pleasure of introducing is professor in the Department of Ag Economics for the ever optimistic and fighting Kansas State Wildcats, Dr. Glenn T. Tonsor. Dr. Tonsor grew up in Missouri, Kansas neighbor to the east on a feral to finish swine farm. He obtained his bachelor's degree from Missouri State University and his PhD from the Kansas State University. While we claim him as a Kansans now, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out he spent several years as a faculty member at our chairwoman's alma mater, the Michigan State University. There is no question Dr. Tonsor's academic profile in the agriculture realm since 2010. Dr. Tonsor has written over 78 peer-reviewed publication, has been a wealth of knowledge in the meat and livestock industry. It's difficult to argue with Dr. Tonson's opinion that, quote, the U.S. beef and cattle industry is arguably the country's most economically important agriculture sector, end quote, which underscores the importance of today's topic. Glenn and his wife Shauna live in St. George, Kansas with their children Ethan, Levi, and Aubrey. Now it's been a while since we've had three K-State Wildcats participate in one hearing, and we look forward to your testimony as well. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, we're wonderful, Senator Roberts and I would be going back and forth between Kansas State and, and Michigan State, and so we're glad to see uh, that uh, we have one person representing both. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm going to turn to Senator Bozeman now for our next introduction. Yes, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Dustin A. Heron, Vice President of Rabo Research Animal Protein uh, and Analyst at Chesterfield, Missouri. Dr. A. Heron is an animal protein analyst at Rabobank focusing on beef. Dr. A. Heron joined the Rabobank Food and Agri Business Group after completing his PhD in pathobiology from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. You guys are taking over. <laughs> <laughs> his previous work focused on cow-calf production, systems assessing both biological and economic efficiency. Dr. Aheron worked as a feed yard sales representative for an animal health company, it was a visiting fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Sloan School of Management. In addition to his PhD, Dr. Aheron has a bachelor's and master's in animal science from Kansas State University. Thank you, Dustin, for being with us today and welcome. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Mary Hendrickson. Uh, Dr. Mary Henderson is an associate professor in the Division of Applied Social Sciences at the University of Missouri. She also serves as co-director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security. She studies the way food production and consumption has changed over the past few decades and how farmers, consumers, and communities can create more sustainable food systems. In 2020, she was a Fulbright Scholar to Iceland teaching sustainable agriculture. From 1997 to 2012, she worked to create local food systems in Missouri as an extension sociologist gaining valuable on the ground experience in transforming food systems. So welcome to each of you. And we will begin uh, today with um, five minutes of uh, witness testimony from each of you, and we certainly welcome anything else in writing that you would like to share with the committee as well. Mr. Tupper. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Uh, we appreciate both the chairwoman and the ranking member for coming together in a bipartisan manner to host this hearing. Uh, this is a, definitely a producer issue. Uh, it's not a partisan issue, so we thank you. I'm privileged to be here representing cattle producers and independent meat processors across the U.S. This hearing is critical because there is a crisis in rural America. We are losing our producers at an alarming rate, all the while watching big corporate feeders, packers make record profits with the threat of vertical integration hanging over our head. As cattle producers, we are natural stewards of the land. 
These family farms, ranchers work day in, day out to produce a high quality protein product in a safe and sustainable way. As we sit here today, producers in my state and across the country are enduring devastating drought conditions. This is just one of the many challenges cattle producers face year in and year out. All the while managing the land, borrowing money to keep the operation running, fighting drastic shifts in weather, and dealing with the rising input costs and a fallen bottom line. Most ranchers who sell their calves at weaning time are selling those calves for less than $1,000 a head. That's somewhere near $100 a head profit after all input costs and amounts to less than a 1% return on investment, an incredible risky business. For those who raise and sell all the way to fat cattle, calving to finish, a finished steer is worth somewhere around $1,600 a head today. Packers could buy that steer, process it, and sell it for beef alone, not counting byproducts, for over $2,800 a head today for a gross margin profit of over 80%. We as cattle producers understand and want the packer to make money. That makes the whole system work. But since 2015, corporate packers' gross margin has ballooned from an average of $100 to $200 a head to well over $1,000 a head. Packers have enjoyed unbelievable profits, harvesting around 120,000 head per day, while cattle producers go out of business and consumers pay double or even triple at the meat counter. Cattle producers, when they make money, they reinvest in their local community, buying and upgrading equipment, paying more for feeder cattle, reinvesting in the land through conservation practices. The corporate packer does not reinvest in the industry or sometimes even in country. Of the four companies that harvest about 85% of the U.S. fed cattle, two of those, JBS and National Beef, are owned and operated outside the United States and Brazil. The main goal of these corporations is not to reinvest in our land or our people, but to create value for their shareholders. Not to mention, the big four packers are also heavily invested in our direct competition, plant-based and lab-grown alternative proteins. The packers in increased control of supply of cattle solely committed to one packer has made it nearly impossible to have active price discovery. In my years as an auctioneer and operating St. Ange Livestock, I've learned the most important participant in true price discovery is the second bidder. In most cases in the fat cattle trade today, we don't have a second bidder. There are simply not enough market participants. In traditional market times, it was assumed when box beef prices rose, the packer would ramp up chain speed to increase profits. Instead, they're using limited chain speed and shackle space to increase profits and make the same money or more harvesting less cattle. So producers see huge losses in equity while the packer reaps all the rewards despite having the least amount of risk and owning the product the least amount of time, while exploiting producers and ultimately the consumer. American cattle producers don't want, nor are we looking for a handout. We just want a fair and equitable playing field, staffed by a referee with a whistle and a flag. Producers cannot be sustainable or generational without being profitable. Building a safe and secure food supply starts with ensuring the success of our food producers. These cattle markets are very complex. We know this. But when there is an oligopoly with four packers controlling the industry, there are only two ways to level the playing field. We can either work to eliminate the occurrence of anti-competitive practices and market manipulation in the meatpacking sector, or as we've seen done in the past in other industries, we can break them up so they cannot have as much influence or ownership in the market. We don't take these challenges lightly. We believe these are critical times. The United States Cattlemen Association, of whom I am testifying on behalf of today, is fighting to secure our food supply system, our rural communities, and our members, and our members' livelihoods. My graduating class in Kimball, South Dakota, 100 miles down the road from Senator Thune's hometown, was 32 in 1991 in rural South Dakota. Just a few weeks ago, in Kimball, South Dakota, they had 19 graduates out of that same high school. They've also combined in athletics. The towns haven't shrunk, but the rural areas and, and the cattle producing areas have. So I thank you for your time and I appreciate and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Gardner. Good afternoon, Chairman Stabenow, Ranking Member Bozeman and members of the committee. 
My name is Mark Gardner from Ashland, Kansas, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to visit today. This is a very important topic for the U.S. beef industry, and I am very pleased to represent beef producers who are committed to the industry to raise the safest and highest quality beef in the world. I am a fifth generation rancher whose 12 family members are all involved in our beef production. Today, our topic is complicated. The cause of this issue is not. A processing plant fire, a pandemic, and a ransomware attack caused extraordinary disruption in processing, resulting in a dramatic drop of the processed beef supply and a bulging oversupply of live cattle. This caused an unprecedented drop in cattle prices while simultaneously leading to a record rise in beef prices, all driven by pure economic market principles. Today, we have too many cattle and too little processing capacity. We have a volatile marketplace created by outside unavoidable factors, not any one market player. We have observed similar market disruptions in lumber, automobiles, and other goods. Now, the solution for all of this is very complicated. Processors are adding capacity due to the demand for high quality beef. Adding this capacity will take time. History tells us we will reach a point when apple processing capacity will compete for a limited supply of cattle. When this happens, the marketplace will shift and the producers will have more leverage. The question for us in the meantime becomes how much damage will regulations do to the marketplace by artificially manipulating the pricing mechanisms? Experiences tells us the unintended consequences of these actions can create longer lasting havoc and even greater volatility to our industry. Let's look at our industry history. From 1980 to 1995, we were the very picture of an industry in trouble. Consumer satisfaction was at an all time low and we were losing market share at a rate that put us in peril of being an irrelevant protein. This loss of market share and dissatisfaction was rooted in the production sector. In other words, producers had to resolve our quality issues at the beginning of the supply chain. What caused the disconnect between our product and the consumer? It's very simple. All cattle were purchased on the average. There were no incentives. One price fit all. Progressive producers needed and wanted to price cattle on a value-based system that paid for each animal based upon value, not average. Superior cattle have more value, inferior cattle have less value. These incentives align producers to respond to consumer signals. Today, we have record beef demand. Producers designed and negotiated these grids with the processors. The information transfer between the industry sectors establishing pricing mechanisms that rewarded producers who delivered the beef the world desired. I want to stress the greatest benefit and the greatest added value has been achieved by the very smallest producers. They have reaped the largest dollar value per head and were given market access. The unintended consequences of regulated government mandates such as Senate Bill 3693 and 543 could potentially have a negative effect on the beef industry. I am unaware of any data or research that indicates these proposed regulations will have a positive change on the price of cattle going forward. There is considerable discussion regarding the cash trade. I look at this as a base price, no different than a commodity like wheat. I can call our local elevator and get the base price for wheat. If I hit the targets of value with my wheat due to protein content or baking quality, I am paid for this additional value. Value-based marketing operates on the same concept. We know the targets of value for the processor and the consumer. If we achieve these goals, we are compensated for producing superior beef. A possible, a possible price discovery that we could look at on the thinly traded cash market is to have all base prices of formula, grid, and alternative market arrangements become a part of mandatory price reporting. This base price needs to be inclusive. I remind you that this comes up for uh, renewal on September 30th of 21. 
any changes that we make are better if implemented by the industry versus government mandates. Thank you so much for the opportunity to visit today. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tonser. Chairwoman Stebenow, Ranking Member Bozeman, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to be here today. The U.S. beef and cattle industry is arguably the country's most important agricultural sector. The sheer size and importance of the industry must be appreciated before implementing any proposed policy change, as the potential exists to impact many members of our society. It is not surprising the industry's markets are complex. I often describe the industry operating as a Rubik's Cube. When one thing changes, so do many others. Industry evolutions are accepted by some, but not all stakeholders, and that is to be expected. Perhaps no relationship is currently more relevant than the relationship of fed cattle inventories to processor capacity. Prior to 2016, it was estimated for many years there was more processing capacity than fed cattle inventories. That relationship changed, and since roughly 2016, fed cattle inventories have often exceeded operational processing capacity in our industry. The whole complaint event of 2019 and developments during the pandemic occurred in this setting. Economists expect lower fed cattle prices and higher beef prices in this situation. On balance, that is what we've observed. Going forward, it is generally expected fed cattle volumes will decline and some physical processing capacity is likely to be added. The U.S. meat industry sells products into three main market channels, domestic retail, domestic food service, and export markets. The industry maximizes overall revenue by producing, processing, and marketing distinct products for these market channels that value them most. This results in higher overall carcass and livestock values. One of the most drastic shocks from the pandemic was extraordinary disruption in the relative demand across these three market channels. These post farm gate developments directly impact derived demand for livestock and hence livestock prices. These shocks also highlight the need and value for better data and information. Over the years, I have worked on multiple projects on the Livestock Mandatory Reporting, or LMR, program. It is important to appreciate a significant amount of more trusted information on the market is now available than was the case prior to LMR, over 20 years ago. Economists have long recognized the substantial value of reliable, accessible, and timely market information because it critically guides resource allocations. I believe USDA AMS does a sound job of implementing LMR, and I encourage ongoing consideration of adjustments and enhancements. Alternative marketing agreements, or AMAs, have grown in use in recent decades. Initial interest in AMAs from both buyer and seller perspectives originated largely from cost or operational efficiencies. Furthermore, consumer demand signals led to proliferation of beef products. This in turn elevated demand for specific cattle, and with that, further interest in use of AMAs. Increased use of AMAs reduces cost and enhances demand in some segments of the industry. That itself is a worthwhile outcome. AMAs present a multitude of well-documented economic benefits while reducing the volume of traditional spot market transactions. For some context, in 2014, 23% of domestic fed cattle were sold on a negotiated basis, while 58% were sold using formulas. More recently, in 2020, negotiated rates were 23%, while formula rates were 65%. The core point of that comment is while cattle prices, beef prices, and estimated margins certainly have changed, they're different in recent years than they were in 2014, and in my opinion, it is inaccurate to assert this simply reflects how fed cattle are marketed. Rather, in my opinion, core differences in supply and demand reflect these market changes. I encourage the industry to proceed forward in a manner that does not deteriorate economic benefits of the industry's evolution to improve beef quality and align effort with beef demand signals. This pursuit should include regularly assessing ways to enhance the information content available on markets. I encourage LMR to not only be reauthorized, but for enhancements to be considered. I've noted some of those in my written submitted testimony. More research is needed on the types of information contemporary markets need and how to most effectively collect and disseminate that information. I will end by highlighting all revenue available to industry participants ultimately originates with consumers. 
Hence, aligning industry efforts with consumer demand is truly essential. Fortunately, the U.S. beef cattle industry is the envy of many others for several reasons. Comparative advantage of the industry include being a global leader in the production of high-quality, grain-finished beef desired by consumers around the world. I encourage today's discussion to be mindful of the factors which favorably distinguish the industry and are core to the prosperity prospects not only of today's industry participants, but also those of future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll hear from Dr. Aheron. Welcome. Chairwoman Stabenow, Ranking Member Bozeman, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to join the discussion today. As an animal protein analyst for Rabobank, which is engaged across the entire beef supply chain, I assist in strategic decision making for both the bank and the bank's clients, offering a research-based perspective on fundamental market dynamics and future trends. Major U.S. beef supply chain disruptions over the past two years have sent the cattle and beef industry into uncharted but explainable territory. The imbalance of excess market-ready cattle supplies in the face of reduced operational packing capacity has put downward pressure on cattle prices. Meanwhile, consumer demand for beef and all animal protein has reached record levels. Fueled by pandemic stockpiling, increased and reallocated consumer income, and more recently, restaurant reopenings, not to mention export demand. These dynamics, combined with elevated processing costs, have increased the spread between beef price and cattle price, just as economic principles, past research, and historical market relationships would suggest. Both the direction and magnitude of the price spread are well within the range of expectation. Like many businesses, the pandemic has created enormous challenges for cattle producers. Seeing the price difference between cattle and beef has only added to that emotional strain. I understand the frustration. I've owned and bred cattle most of my life, and I have friends and family that make a living ranching and feeding cattle. However, with stakeholders that are invested throughout the entire supply chain, from rancher to packer to retailer, I have to look at the beef industry from an objective and analysis-based perspective. First, cattle are not beef. Cattle are one of several inputs into beef production. Other major inputs include labor, physical capital, and technology. These inputs are always seeking but never finding the perfect balance between one another. This creates cycles. Input imbalances are communicated through prices, whether that's cattle prices, wages, or investment. Over the past several years, extreme and unexpected events have severely restricted several of these inputs. For example, facilities in the August 2019 Tyson plant fire and labor during the pandemic. A working market sends price signals to adjust. These same price signals created record high cattle prices and record packer losses in 2014 and 2015. The biology and natural time delays of the beef industry make it slow moving and capital intensive. Adjustments take years. While recent unforeseen events have exacerbated the situation, free market signals, economic losses, drought, and the natural cattle cycle laid the foundation for today's circumstances over several decades. Beef packing has historically been a low margin business. In the year 2000, with total cattle population of 98 million head, the U.S. harvested nearly 30 million head of fed cattle. By 2014 and 2015, the total cattle population was below 90 million head, with 2015 fed cattle slaughter under 23 million head. Throughout this period of largely drought-induced beef cow herd contraction, the most inefficient packing plants were driven out of business as competition for limited cattle supplies drove cattle prices to record highs. From 2000 to 2015, the U.S. beef industry experienced a net decline of roughly 14,000 head per day in fed cattle processing capacity. Even before the extremes of 2020, recent margins suggest that there is opportunity to add packing capacity. However, that opportunity does not come without significant risk. First, the upfront cost of a new or expanded plant is extremely expensive. Industry sources estimate costs of 100 million to 120 million for every 1,000 head of daily capacity. Increasing construction costs over the past year likely put current costs even above that estimate. 
Then a new endeavor must meet regulatory requirements, build a labor force, and keep enough cash on hand to absorb losses. It's not just about building facilities, it's about building a business model. In response to the described market signals, numerous plans for greenfield plants or expansions of existing facilities have been unveiled in recent months. These plans come from new entrants, minor incumbents, and major incumbents alike. If all the announced plans for construction and expansion come to fruition, roughly 8,000 head of daily fed cattle capacity and nearly 2,000 head of non-fed capacity could be added over the next five years. Recognizing current drought conditions, if the beef cow herd declines by less than, say, 2%, there's opportunity for profitability with 5,000 head per day of expansion. A note of caution. There is a point where industry expansion goes too far and does not withstand tight cattle supplies. The long-term cattle cycle, drought risks, and market fundamentals must be considered. Technology implementation will also be a critical component of future success. Recently, many packers have revitalized their focus on technology as, and development as a means to address these labor challenges, manage costs, and reduce product waste. Enlightened by the pandemic to the long-standing labor shortages in the meat industry, many startups are also bringing outside expertise and perspectives to advance technology and automate the supply chain. In closing, the shocks of the beef industry over the last couple years have presented the entire beef supply chain with enormous challenges. The resulting price movements have been frustrating to say the least. Yet, these same price movements and supply chain disruptions have accelerated investment in packing capacity, new technologies, and new business strategies that will help keep the beef industry evolving towards changing demands. And that's the market at work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hendrickson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Stabenow, Ranking Member Bozeman, and members of the committee. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about the social arrangements, the social impacts of market arrangements in the cattle industry. As a rural sociologist, I'm concerned about the impacts that market arrangements have on people, on people and their communities. My concern centers around the these relationships, the, the impacts of market organization on relationships between farmers, consumers, and communities, in effect, the social infrastructure that can make our food system and our communities resilient. And this leads me to focus on the broader impacts of competitive markets. Now, competitive markets exist when no one seller, no one buyer can influence the marketplace. It means that no actor has the power to define choices or prices or ways of participating in the marketplace. Competitive markets encourage a diversity of organizational forms, and they encourage multiple linkages across actors. Uh, they can also de decentralize decision-making over food. So the power to make decisions about what food is produced, how, where, by whom, and who gets to eat it has become increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few people that are located in transnational agri-food companies. As has already been stated, the four largest beef packing firms were responsible for 85% of U.S. steer and heifer slaughter in 2018. Four of the largest cattle feeders have a one-time capacity to feed over two and a half million head. And this is in contrast to the over 750,000 cow-calf farms in the U.S. that have an average herd size of about 40 head. Now, while looking for profit, these producers are also concerned with their autonomy and well-being, as well as their other relationships with farmers and the community. So what are the impacts of consolidated decision-making in the cattle industry, as well as in the larger food and agricultural sector? At the farm level, agri-food consolidation reduces farmer autonomy. It means fewer choices for farmers about where they market their animals. My colleague Harvey James and I have argued that fewer market options constrains, uh, as in limits or inhibits, the decisions of farmers. It constrains as in, as in compels or obliges them into decisions they might not otherwise have made. We've also argued that basic agri-food liberties, such as the freedom to negotiate and dictate terms, or the freedom to know, can be constrained when agri-food markets are consolidated. 
As I stated, I'm particularly concerned about social relationships and communities. Rural sociologists conducting a meta-analysis of the relationship between agriculture structure and community well-being found detrimental effects in 82% of the 50 studies they reviewed. A Missouri farmer once told me, I used to look around to see if any farmers were getting out of farming so I could get their land to farm. Now I look around and I see I have no neighbors. Anthropologists at the University of Kansas showed that a consolidated agriculture without people has depopulated Western Kansas with an accompanying collapse in social relationships. Researchers in Europe have shown that less concentration of agricultural production enhances social cohesion. And that is the glue that allows groups and communities to accomplish their goals and dreams. This pandemic has shown us a number of flaws in our food system. I want to highlight that worker health and well-being are very important indicators of food system sustainability, and both were severely impacted by COVID-19. There was a strong relationship between proximity of livestock plants and the incidence of COVID-19 over time. Many of these processing plants were shut down due to COVID-19 infections, causing a backup of live animals to be slaughtered. Now, these animals have to be fed, which causes uh, rising costs, raising costs for farmers, or in some cases, euthanized, which causes economic and psychological harm. There are ecological concerns about animal welfare and the waste of natural resources, such as the soil and water embodied in those animals. Now, what can we do? I don't believe that there's any one approach at any given scale that will prove effective. Instead, we need a combination of actions, strategies, and policies at multiple levels that are ecological, democratic, and equitable within and across populations, generations, and species. And this is the way we're going to build redundancy and provide fallbacks when some organizations or networks fail. I thank you for this opportunity, Madam Chairwoman, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you so much, and we appreciate very much the input from uh, all of our witnesses today. Uh, Mr. Tupper, let me start with you today. As a producer and a livestock auction operator, which we have now had a demonstration of, which we appreciate, you see the negotiated cash market up close. Uh, what impacts do you see in the actual sale barn when there are fewer packers and other participants bidding on cattle during an auction? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for the question, and I respectfully disagree with uh, many of the colleagues that spoke uh, after me about what that is. Uh, as we talk about uh, the, the shackle space and, and limiting the amount of packers that play, they talk about efficiencies uh, that these big packers can make. Well, we give up in efficiencies, we would get back in competition. So every time that we gain efficiencies, we lose competition. Uh, I think that uh, uh, when we talk about whether the shackle space being the important thing, so under their scenarios, I, it concerns me and my producers that if the only way we can make money is if uh, there is uh, less cattle than there is shackle space. That's, that's their theory, that shackle space is the only thing that can determine whether we can be profitable. And uh, I respectfully definitely disagree. But we, we need more players in the marketplace, and competition is huge. Uh, we would definitely give up some of those efficiencies to have more competition. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tonser, to follow up on this, um, when fewer packers are participating, in these markets. We often hear concerns about market transparency because live cattle prices don't get reported due to USDA's current confidentiality rules under livestock mandatory reporting. Do you have any suggestions on how those confidentiality guidelines could be improved? So yes, I do. Um, my first response would be as a point of clarity is covered packers have to submit information to USDA, and regardless if there's one, two, or five, it all gets submitted to USDA. The distinction that's important is what does or can USDA do with that information? So that is part of the uh, transparency discussion. So it all gets reported to USDA. Not all of it shows up on a report to the public, depending on how confidentiality is approached, is what I'm trying to make clear for this body first and foremost. The 370-20 rule is the common confidentiality approach that's used by USDA. 
Uh, I noted in my written testimony that should always be, not always, periodically re-examined. Uh, there is a history of a different approach being used. At the end of the day, anything that USDA does when it comes to implementing LMR is a trade-off between aggregation and precision. And you can aggregate across more categories to get more buyers and more types of transaction to make it more likely you can report, but then you have the cost of precision. Simple example I offered in my written testimony is maybe aggregating steers and heifers by definition would add volume rather than trying to separate them separately. That alone may not get you another buyer, but that's a simple example this body can relate to. I encourage more of those things to be considered. The Thank second you. thing, real quickly, is as it relates to the data that's submitted, currently that's done on a whole state basis. So the state of Kansas is one unit, state of Nebraska is one unit and so forth. Uh, something that's worth thinking about is whether or not that could be submitted on a more precise level. So think sub-states of a state or even zip code or something, which potentially, and please note I'm saying potentially, would allow USDA to report differently and address confidentiality that way their hands are sort of tied by the way data is shared with them at the whole state level currently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Hendrickson, I really appreciate your perspective as we think about how we're going to move forward after the pandemic. And in announcing the framework for funding to improve resiliency in the food supply chain, the USDA identified four pillars of focus, supporting production, improving processing, investing in distribution and aggregation, and creating new market opportunities. So I'm wondering, what are some of the factors that you think that the USDA should consider as they design the program so that we can assure these investments have real impact and sustainability in the long run? Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Stabenow. Um, one of the things that I think USDA needs to consider as they design this program is how will they build in redundancy and resiliency. And one of the things that we saw with the pandemic is that we had a very brittle food supply chain, not just in cattle, but across the board. We had a very br brittle food supply chain. We know that local and regional farmers and businesses were much uh, faster and more nimble at responding to the impacts of the pandemic than were far-flung supply chains. So what we need to do is to figure out how we're going to build in fail-safe mechanisms. So how can we have a redundancy in processing? And these should be priorities as USDA focuses on processing, on aggregation, and so on. So I, th I think it's important to regionalize the food system, to find ways to regionalize the food system so we're not as dependent on these uh, North American or global kinds of uh, uh, production consumption relationships. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Bozeman for your questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Gardner, uh, we've all heard about the devastating impact impacts the Holcomb packing plant fire and the COVID-19 pandemic had uh, on many cattle producers. Can you describe your personal experience weathering these events? Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. Um, you know, in this business, we all deal with uh, risk all the time. So we work to, to lay off risk with forward contracting, hedging, uh, I mean, placing cattle at different times. And uh, I often talk about uh, our management and our genetics uh, and uh, the, the access to these places uh, based on that quality alone gives us systems that allow us to, to hit those target at varying times. And so, yes, that delayed it, that made a bottleneck, but uh, our relationships with these people allowed us uh, through the pandemic, uh, you know, I'll go back to a year ago right now. I mean, uh, they were able to, to take away all of the discounts on our grid and uh, they incentivized us uh, and helped us get through that. Uh, many of the other processors were offering a base price of 95 and our base price was uh, for all those cattle, cash included, was $1.15. So I think when we look at these things, uh, I mean, by nature, cattlemen are the, the ultimate optimist, but they're the ultimate gamble. And so with weather, drought, market access, and, and all of these things, I mean, it's almost like with the fire, the pandemic, and now the ransomware, what else can they hit us with? And so 
Uh, we have to be flexible, and the flexibility of all of these things have allowed us to manage risk. Uh, Doctor, I'm sorry. Dr. Tonser, can you explain the risks and benefits of alternative marketing agreement use and the risk and benefits of a mandated volume of cash market trade? And, and then also, uh, you know, you talk a lot about uh, data and things and the importance of that. Have the risk and benefits of both of these topics been clearly quantified? So, of course, it's hard for an academic to answer that in the short minutes here, but I will do my best. Uh, the benefits and cost of AMAs themselves have been studied extensively over time by economists. Uh, to summarize and keep it jargon-free, most of the economic benefits would come down to helping coordinate. So efficiencies of knowing I have a place to send my cattle, efficiencies of knowing cattle are coming in from both the buyer and seller's perspective um, are substantial. That makes our system, quote-unquote, more efficient is what's underneath that statement as well as aligning the demand signals. So I made the comment about proliferation of beef products. There's a whole bunch of different beef products that go into those three different market channels that I alluded to. Some of that goes back to asking for cattle to be bred differently, certainly raised differently, conveying information with them and so forth, that doesn't align well with a spot market traditionally. So a lot of the economic benefits on the demand side align with use of AMAs. That'd be my main response on AMAs. What is the benefit and cost of bumping up cash spot or mandating cash spot was the second half of your question. I think an honest answer is economists haven't quantified those costs very well yet. Uh, I can just give you a personal opinion because that's the best I can do as long as I'm transparent on that is I get concerned when we add rigidity to a system and we get in the way of people being entrepreneurs and doing things a little bit differently. Any kind of government mandate gives me that pause. Those that have heard me before know that's my MO that I respond to. Um, my concern beyond that, that would certainly be a cost in this specific case, is the more we bumped up cash share being quote unquote required, is exactly what would be done to just meet the specs. What would a negotiated trade look like? Would it be different than formula and forward and so forth? Uh, LMR in many ways was designed to be a price reporting as opposed to a regulatory effort. And that needs to be thought about carefully. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Dr. Hey, Hare, uh, there are several new beef processing plants that have been announced in the last year. Ranchers and feeders are investing in these facilities in many instances. A greater degree of supply chain coordination through AMAs will be utilized to procure the, the cattle for the plants. Can you speak to why these new market entrants may choose to pursue AMAs over the other? Uh, if a certain volume of cash trade were mandated, what might the impact be on these new facilities uh, or other investors considering entering the business? Certainly. So I think it's important to look at how a lot of these new plants are being designed. They're being designed around niche markets, product differentiation, because they're not going to be able to compete in terms of economy of scale and efficiency with the large incumbents. So they have to separate themselves based on product quality and really truly meeting consumer demands. And if you have specific specs in the beef that you're looking for, you have to have specific specs in the cattle that you're looking for as well. And so to guarantee that you have enough cattle and you have identified suppliers of the cattle that meet those programs, you're going to want a strong relationship with your suppliers. One of the best ways to build those strong relationships is through AMAs. If, if cash were mandated, in this situation, it would severely hamstring the ability for these smaller regional plants that are likely going to have to compete in, in niche markets to be able to differentiate themselves from the large, more efficient incumbents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I believe we have Senator Klobuchar with us virtually. Senator Klobuchar. That's right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the witnesses, such important issues. Uh, we just want to start out with a quick question um, uh, to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Tupper. Uh, the pandemic painfully exposed high risk to our food supply. Senator Moran and I um, worked on the um, ramp up act that was included in the December relief package uh, to help small plants um, with um, uh, inspection and get the inspections they needed and the like. Um, how does having a more diversified meat packing industry help improve resiliency in our food chain? Because clearly the pandemic showed some of the problems. 
Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, I think uh, having more uh, small and regional packing plants is huge, but I think that we have to look at it as more than just shackle space. They have to be sustainable, uh, and we, we have to make sure that they're able to succeed. Uh, we have a history in some of these buildings, some of the small and regional plants of it taking uh, three or four different owners before they can be prosperous. And I think another onus on those small plants is when they go to sell that meat or try to get their market share, uh, it's very difficult when you're dealing with four major packers that are ready to squeeze you out at any time because you're trying to take a share of their business. So I think it's important, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's definitely uh, better for our security of our food system to have more small and regional packers. But we have to, besides just build them, we have to be able to make sure they can succeed. Okay, very good point. Thank you for that. Um, in Minnesota, around 90% of our cattle leave the state for processing and cattle inventories have outpaced processing. Um, we'd like to make this work better. I guess I would go to you, um, uh, Dr. Tonzer, what barriers prevent the expansion of livestocking processing capacity? Uh, Thank you. It's been alluded to. Um, there are many economic drivers of why we have the packing processing sector the way we do today. Uh, economies of scale is the most often noted one. So I've used the term efficiency at least three times already today. That simply means the larger operations have a cost advantage per unit to keep it jargon free. Um, but I will also note that something that has been added, in my opinion, in the last probably 20 years with the proliferation of additional beef products is economies of scope. So the ability to not only produce a high volume and be cost efficient to run the plants efficiently, but also to be able to sustain large volumes of multiple types of beef products must be noted. And that is something that a smaller operation will have as a challenge. So that, you can look at that as a opportunity or a threat. You, gotta, you can't compete with bigger operators on everything is the point of that. My colleague to my left noted that as well. Um, you have to narrow your business. And I think that is harder if you're a new entrant in the small, medium-sized place when you're facing not only economies of scale, but economies of scope for a lot of current incumbents. Okay, very good. Um, so I am uh, working uh, with the antitrust subcommittee on a number of uh, pieces of legislation, as some of you may know, uh, related to, um, which would be helpful, I believe, in this market with um, being more pro-competitive and uh, changing some of the standards we use to analyze um, not just mergers, but looking backwards at what's happening in industries. Uh, we're also going to be holding a hearing uh, coming up soon on uh, meatpacking as well as the food supply chain in judiciary um, that I'm helping to head up. Mr. Tupper, how important is it that uh, the agencies continue to investigate the current cattle market dynamics and provide updates of their findings whenever possible. Thank you again, Senator Klobuchar. I think uh, uh, very, very important, and we thank uh, uh, USDA uh, and the new Secretary Vilsack uh, for his willingness to work on these issues. He has stated uh, that he's wanting to look at the uh, Packers and Stockyards Act, uh, and, and we definitely need these investigations into the antitrust uh, theories uh, to, to come out. Uh, one of the questions that always gets asked in a free market system, uh, why aren't any of the big four packers trying to gain more market share? If it's truly a free market system and it's not antitrust, why are they not trying to gain market share upon each other? And that, that's something that always comes to mind. But uh, yes, I, we, we definitely uh, encourage and, and appreciate your work on that, uh, trying to get these antitrust legislations worked through. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Senator Marshall. Well, thank you, Chairman, and again, welcome to all of our witnesses. I'll have my first question for uh, Mark Gardner. Um, Mark, I would like for you just to share a little bit about the story of U.S. premium beef. What were the ag economics like when you made the decision to do that? And as I recall, it was basically cattle producers that, that formed this packing plant. Thank you, Senator Marshall. Um, it was very similar to some of the things we're talking about today. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, we were, one out of four steaks ate bad. Our product was terrible. We were losing market share at a rate that um, Dr. Harlan Ritchie, Ritchie of Michigan State University 
wrote a paper that said five years to meltdown. At the rate we were losing market share, we were not going to be relevant in the protein business. I was 35 years old. We were scared to death uh, about investing. You know, it's been mentioned oftentimes about investing in our community and investing in our infrastructure. We wanted to put some skin in the game to understand what made cattle better. And so we made the investments. We made that purchase of national beef as a group of 470 plus stockholders because our cattle weren't very good. Ours weren't any different than the rest of them. And so when we went about doing that, all of a sudden, and we've got that information on each and every animal, we started to learn what we needed to do to align our supply with consumer demand. You know, uh, my biggest view of the problem at the time was one price fits all. And that's part of the discussion today on the cash markets. It's very thin, but you're pricing everything on the average. We wanted to go to value-based systems that valued each and every animal. And this was successful because all of a sudden, when you realize your animals aren't hitting those targets, we change our genetics, we change our management, we change our feeding strategies, and we have vertical coordination of information to help all of us become more profitable. So the realization that the beef industry was in so much trouble losing market share and our product was, was not very good, that is what changed it to where we have more beef demand today. And so that is what we have done, and our cattle have led the charge of improving the quality of the beef cattle in the United States. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mark. And, and Dr. Tonser, maybe I'll go to you, you next. You know, everywhere I travel, people tell me that American beef is the best product on the market. There's no one else that can compete with them. Even if the Australians maybe have a, could, could beat us on price, the quality of our beef is what drives it. And there's huge export opportunities across the world for, for more markets. If we lost this value-based system that we have now, how do you think it would impact those export markets? Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the question. Remember my testimony, the three different market channels, so domestic food service, domestic retail or grocery, and export. Yes. We send different products to those three channels. That's part of what you're alluding to and I'm reminding this body. So beef products find the market where they're most valuable. I would be concerned, to answer the question directly, if we erode incentives to have quality enhancement in the industry, at what point does the U.S. lose its current comparative advantage in high quality beef? That would not happen overnight, right? Because some of those things are genetic, feed, management, reputation, some of those have long legs. But we need to think through very carefully what the economic signals are for each one of those steps and what that signals to consumers. Eventually, I would think you would lose market share, not only in the export market, but domestic food service and domestic retail, because all three of them, you're competing with other proteins. Sometimes it's beef, sometimes it's a non-beef, but it's a protein marketplace globally. Yep. Thank you for that answer. And then, uh, Dr. Ahern, um, my phone has blown up like it's never blown up before. Friends that I've grown up with since I was a, a child, people in the ranching industry, folks that own small feedlots, cow-calf operations, uh, just concerned about the situation. Uh, feedlots that I've known, again, for decades, where there used to be 10 or 15 buyers were there, or having one person show up and offer a price. The cell barn that I worked every weekend from the time I was 16 until I was 20 used to have dozens of buyers show up. And now there's only two or three, maybe four buyers show up. What, what would you tell them the, the why? How come that's where we are today? There's, there's not a, an easy answer to that, but I think a lot of it's been alluded to the fact that the industry has moved towards these value-based marketing systems where we can reward cattle based on their different quality traits. One point that was mentioned earlier today that I think helps explain this some, cash trade as a percentage of total transactions really hasn't changed since 2014, 2015, but what has changed is price. Cattle prices were at record highs in 2014 and 15, and then they've been challenged recently, but yet that negotiated trade level really hasn't changed. 
What has changed over that time is the supply relative to demand for those cattle. And I want to emphasize one thing that we've kind of danced around is that consumer demand is really what drives the price and the value of these animals, but it's processing capacity that allows that demand to trickle down to the cattle feeder, to the cow-calf producer. So while there might be great consumer demand in today's market, it's not necessarily trickling down to the cattle feeder in the same way that it did in 2014 because of that oversupply of cattle relative to packing capacity. And that is going to change. Over the next several years, the cow herd will likely decline. We're in a drought situation, liquidation phase. So it's frustrating from an optic standpoint, but we're in a national market where total supply and total demand really drive price. Thank you, and I yield back. The Senator Jill Bryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, in New York, uh, there is a very high demand for increasing processing capacity at small facilities, and farmers are often booking slaughter dates several months or over a year in advance. On Monday, USDA announced their new meat and poultry inspection readiness grant program to assist small and medium-sized transition to USDA FSIS inspection. And I'm hopeful this program will meet the, the, processing the needs of the processing facilities in New York. Uh, Mr. Tonzer, with the consolidation in processors, this has led to a decreased buyers and processing options, as well as increased opportunities for market disruptions if just one facility goes offline. Outside of the aforementioned grant program, what other options need further exploration to increase capacity at smaller facilities? So there's a whole host of governmental discussions around subsidizing grants, you know, increasing access to credit and the like. Uh, those all have a place there. I don't think it's in my wheelhouse to advocate for one of those or not. I think just at the point in time, you have a lot of society interest in that. Um, bodies like this can listen to that. That's my short answer. Thank you. Dr. Hendrickson, in your testimony, you touched on the need for flexibility, particularly in areas like processing, and you also mentioned the social value of communities and neighbors. I've worked to invest in our rural communities and strengthen our local food systems in New York um, so that um, more food from New York producers can get to other parts of the state. You also point out that consolidation is an agri-food system-wide concern in your comments, which is a sentiment that I share. First, can you speak more about how decentralizing and making our cattle market more resilient can also help our rural communities thrive? And second, can you elaborate about consolidation in the cattle industry and its connection to consolidation in the dairy sector and how this broad con um, consolidation impacts family farms and consumers? Yes, thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Um, the, the investments that we can make in uh, regional food systems have a lot of impact on communities, farmers, food businesses. We know that uh, we've done some work around local food, economic impacts of local food, and we know that the returns to uh, food, the economic returns stay in the communities and have a larger um, economic impact. And there's quite a bit of body of data on that that shows that those, those uh, returns are good for building the economic base of the community. But my concern is on, on people and the social relationships and what happens when we do decentralize and when we uh, can build relationships between farmers and eaters, we start to build kind of this social infrastructure that I talked about earlier. And that social infrastructure is really important uh, and necessary for communities. And one of, the, one of the ways I'll just point out, during the pandemic, those cities that were able to, organ to um, uh, use existing networks, strong networks that, were, that had a lot of social cohesion, they were much uh, more effective in getting aid out to people who needed emergency food aid, for instance. And so that's just one example of the returns that we can have to um, social infrastructure. Uh, 
I, uh, I, I don't think that this is just a cattle problem or a dairy problem or a, a hog problem or a protein problem. What we see are a, a consolidation across the board and we need to really think about buyer power in that consolidation arena and that starts with who's buying these food products, the Walmarts, the Whole Foods, the um, other, the consolidated retailers. Um, that's a buyer power issue, um, but it goes throughout the system. We see consolidation on the farm side. We see consolidation in the in, uh, processing, distribution, all of these things. And I think we have to address it um, in multiple fashions. And I think one of the things that we need to think about is how are we going to create a diversity of ownership and control where consumers and farmers um, can negotiate these, these relationships that they want that are socially um, important for, for them in their communities. Thank you. Thank you. Even though New York isn't a large beef cattle producing state, we do still have a fair number of beef operations, over 7,000 farms with over 100,000 beef cows, according to 2017 Ag Census. In addition, we also have large dairy cow population, over 4,500 dairy farms with over 600,000 dairy cows with many of those dairy cows eventually making their way to the ground beef market as cull cows. And finally, we have a fair number of veal calves originating from dairy farms. Over the past several years, dairy farms have begun to transition lower genetic quality dairy cows to beef to increase their profits for dairy calves. These calves are often then raised as feeder cattle for the beef market. Mr. Tupper, how do smaller beef states like New York remain competitive and ensure that cattle producers receive fair prices? And what are the potential opportunities to expand markets for retired dairy cows to be used as beef? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I think you're exactly right. There is much more done in the dairy sector, uh, crossbreeding, to uh, bring those uh, cattle into the beef sector. Uh, I think ways that they can stay competitive is, is we've got to keep these markets fair. We've got to be able to make sure that uh, the bigger the better isn't, bigger is not always better. Uh, the bigger the packer is, sometimes they squeeze out these small and regional packers that we're trying to build and get shackle space for. So I think one of the main ways that they can stay competitive is make sure that they can get a market share and they can fairly be in that marketplace. Uh, so I, I think that's the best way that we can keep them competitive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. As we go back and forth here to vote, uh, hopefully everyone who is with us at the moment has voted on the first vote. Um, Senator Tuberville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today. Uh, you know, back in Alabama, uh, cattle production represents $2.5 billion industry, so I'm thankful we're having this today and because we got a lot of our farmers and cattle growers in serious trouble. Uh, Start with Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner, your experience using alternative marketing agreements to compensate for the investment your family has made to improve the genetics of your herd is a compelling experience. Alabama is home to thousands of small cow calf producers, and I'm curious to know how these agreements can benefit producers like those in my state. Can you elaborate? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Senator, I would uh, first thank you for the question, but I would stress that that these AMAs that we have developed are actually the very best for the small producer uh, that have allowed them to, to take their genetics and take their managements and being able to have that market access uh, for those superior cattle and for those superior management. So I think we have to look at the marketplace and we have to look at where do we fit into that marketplace and how do we go forward on a demand driven market. And I think when we look at a lot of the discussion, and I agree with uh, much that's been said, uh, the challenge for everybody, whether you're a cow-calf producer or a processor, is how are you profitable? And if you look back in history, uh, 100 years ago, uh, we had lots more processors. And the blunt truth of the matter, why they are not here today, is they were not processor. They were not profitable. And so when I look at... Uh, uh, I work with customers every day. How do we change our management systems? How do we create cattle that somebody wants? Uh, how do we coordinate and align these beef cattle with consumer demand, which ultimately aligns with profitability? And so it takes organization, coordination. It takes working together. Uh, 
as we go back to one of the earlier questions, uh, we had all these exact same problems. We still have them today. And so we work with whether you're from Alabama, Kansas, or Alaska, how do we reach the market and how do we make all of these systems better to be more profitable? And I would stress that the absolute smallest producers have reaped the highest dollar for head value on our, on our value-based grid because they can hit those targets better than anybody else has. And quite frankly, that is what's kept my family in business. That's what kept our other families in business. And that's what we go as we go forward. My concern is with mandates is all of a sudden, uh, I've spent all these years, as many others have too, uh, I am mandated to go back to average pricing for one price fits all. And that's why I think when we look at, at the information and, and the thinly traded cash market, and Dr. Tonzer alluded to it, so if we can put all base prices of formula, grid, and AMAs into the mandatory price reporting, this is the base price, and that becomes all-inclusive, then we're going to have a more robust, more transparent market. So, to, uh, Senator, I just would stress to you is when we know where those targets are and we align them with consumer demand, uh, we're rewarded for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tonser, uh, you know, back in my state, uh, beef cattle is second to, uh, behind broiler chickens. And uh, can you explain how beef competes with other proteins in the market, such as chicken and pork? I'd, I'd be particularly interested in your thoughts about AMAs and the role they might play as beef, beef's overall competitiveness among other proteins. Sure. So I do spend a lot of my time monitoring meat demand, and meat is broader than just beef, right? So multiple proteins, as you alluded to. Uh, meat demand is high. It's not unique to beef. We must note that. Over time, uh, some of the work I've done actually says what economists call cross-price effects. So the price change on pork and chicken has less of an effect on beef today than it did 20 years ago. My opinion on why that's happened is there's a quality distinction that's grown over that 20 years. And it's not just price, it's price and other considerations that make somebody switch from protein A to protein B. Hence why we're here today. I think we have a quality, we be in the beef industry in that statement, there's a quality advantage in the eye of the typical consumer that justifies them paying more per pound, typically, for beef than they do for pork or chicken. If it's simply a cost per pound of protein, then the protein that wins is simply who can produce that the cheapest and most efficiently. That is not something that's in the wheelhouse that's favorable for the beef industry. Hence my comment on comparative advantage in my oral testimony. Over time, the beef industry's had a comparative advantage on high quality, good eating experience that has helped them position themselves well compared to other proteins. Thank you. Madam Chair, my time is up, but I'd like to submit a couple of questions for them to answer. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you very much. Absolutely, without objection. Um, Senator Booker, and then we'll have Senator Grassley. Senator Booker. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, put some questions towards my friend, Dr. Hendrickson. Uh, you know, COVID really talked, showed how fragile our food system is. Uh, and we see our system really break down in pretty stunning ways. Consumers were paying higher prices for meat while ranchers were paid less for their cattle, but the big consolidated companies uh, really made record pro profits. And COVID didn't create this problem. It really shined a light on what was going on. And many of the witnesses who testified talked about how there is uh, really record concentration going on right now uh, in the meatpacking industry. Companies like Tyson, Cargill, JBS, and National Beef control uh, more than 80% of all the U.S. beef processing. Uh, I've been concerned about these extreme levels of concentration for years, and as you know, I've introduced a number of bills to try to, to try to deal with that. Bills with multiple colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Uh, Senator Tester and I uh, put together a bill that would stop these ag mergers, put a moratorium on them. Um, I've introduced another bill, the Farm Systems Reform Act, which would make reforms to the Packers and Stockyards Act, uh, including a prohibition on meat packer ownership of livestock more than seven days prior to slaughter and a requirement for meat packers to buy at least 50% of all cattle from open cash auctions. Uh, the bill would also address a problem that Mr. Tupper described in his testimony and would stop the USDA from allowing imported beef to be deceptively labeled 
as products of the United States of America, which is uh, so against uh, the ideals, I think, that, that we have when we label something product of the USA, at least it's deceptive to the consumer. And I'll be introducing uh, legislation with Senator Lee to reform the federal checkoff programs, which our ranchers uh, and meat packers are, uh, and, excuse me, which our ranchers are forced to pay into a program that's used to benefit the giant meat packers. And so th there's so much in this system that is clearly unfair, clearly working against producers. Um, and driving many of them out of the market, and as you have talked about, uh, uh, hurting so many of our rural communities. So Dr. Henderson, um, if we actually use the antitrust laws that we have today, I wonder if you can uh, uh, show what, breaking up these companies uh, and this, uh, this unprecedented consolidation, what would the impact have on farmers and ranchers and those rural communities, and what might ha the impact uh, of uh, of, of stopping uh, this kind of consolidation have on the resiliency of our, of our food systems in moments of crisis, uh, uh, whether it be droughts or, uh, frankly, uh, what we just saw with COVID. Thank you, Senator Booker. The, I think the big thing about resiliency is that we have to have a way to have um, fallbacks or uh, fail-safe mechanisms. And what concentration does in the food system, it, it focuses on efficiency and specialization. And it doesn't say, oh, what's gonna happen if if something, if, if we have like a pandemic or we have a disaster, we have these ransomware attacks. And everybody keeps saying that, oh, these are black swan events, but they happened and we weren't very well prepared for them. So we have to think about how we can prepare for them in the future. And resiliency requires a diversity of different kinds of forms, large scale, small scale, cooperatively owned, publicly owned, these kinds of things. It requires a lot of diversity in, in the system. And it also requires a different kind of connectivity, modular connectivity where if you take out one node, it doesn't um, uh, crash the whole system. And I think those are really important aspects of it. And I'm not sure that current antitrust law actually, um, the way it's been interpreted, it's been difficult for, for these kinds of um, questions about resiliency and fairness um, to be embraced within the current iterations of, of antitrust. And so I think we need to think, you know, some of the, the policies that you're talking about um, are potentially ways that we can um, um, have a system that really connects farmers and consumers, connects uh, communities, and really pays attention to the ecologies in which these people, which um, these relationships take place. And I think that's really important. And, you know, we saw this in the time of Upton Sinclair in the jungle. We're more concentrated than even at that time. And what is, real quick, in the seconds I have left, the consumer impact uh, also would be affected too by a more in, uh, diverse uh, system, correct? That's right, and a lot of my uh, fellow panelists have, set, have talked about consumer demand driving everything, but if consumers don't know about their food system and most of the information about food is not, they can't find it out. And so that, anything we can do to make it more apparent for them to choose what they want, I think is really good. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Senator Grassley. Madam Chairman, I want to put an editorial on the record from the President of the Iowa Farm Bureau. Without objection. Okay. Secondly, I want to give a couple takeaways so far from this meeting. We've got one witness that says we have a cozy setup. Don't pass any laws to affect any of that uh, cozy setup. That isn't going to work for the farmers in my state that are uh, t uh, mad about the $1,200 profit that the packers are making, and they get uh, a low price compared to other people, and uh, they uh, have to wait 30 days in some instances to market their product. That is going to demand action by this Congress to take care of that unfair situation. The other uh, takeaway is that I have not heard anybody justify this situation I just described where farmers don't make a profit, the family farmer, and uh, the Packers make a $1,200 uh, profit, and uh, there's no benefit to the consumer. My first question is to Mr. Tupper, being a cow-calf producer as you are, 
Over the past 20 plus years, there's been a drastic shift in the purchase agreements. Uh, for where the early 2000s, more than 50% of the cattle were traded on a negotiated basis. But now it's only about 20% cash, maybe even less than that, I've heard. Uh, I've also heard from many Iowa cattlemen who fought to keep auction markets open and functioning uh, as close to a normal during the pandemic because they're so vital to price discovery in the cattle industry. So this question to you, does captive supply create more leverage for packers to pay lower prices for fed cattle in the cash market? And how does the lack of cash trade ultimately impact livestock auction markets? Thank you, Senator Grassley. And it definitely uh, is a definite yes. It impacts it hugely. When the big four can have uh, all of that captive supply so they do not have to go out and compete for those cattle, then they can push down the prices. Uh, one of the other things that, that I would like to say to Mr. Gardner, uh, when we talk about the, the differences in cattle and prices, there used to be four or five buyers come out to your, your state in Iowa and look at cattle, and they could still buy those cattle on an up basis. They don't have to have an AMA to, to give more for those cattle. At any time, they can go to Senator Grassley's feedlot and say he has a superior set of cattle, and the base price that everybody else is given is $1.20, and they can bid them $1.25. So I strongly disagree that that helps within the market. Uh, I think the other part of your question is that if we had more competition out there and they could not hold captive supply, then when we have high box beef prices, we would directly see the benefit of that. Uh, the argument that shackle space, there's no question we need more, but uh, we do not get to see the direct benefit of higher box beef because we don't have competition and they can have captive supply. Thank you. Okay. Also, Mr. Tupper, you mentioned that alternative marketing and agreements like formulas offer advantages to producers, but that they also adversely affect price transparency, price discovery, price competition. Iowa leads the nation in cash trade nearing 60 percent, and they're frustrated that they're uh, shouldering the burden. How do we know what cattle are worth in regions that don't have price discovery? Are small independent producers offered the same opportunities to market their cattle as big producers do through formula contracts? And I would say definitely they are not. We know and we need a contract library that uh, tells us this. Uh, they definitely, uh, some of the big corporate feedlots are getting a different deal than uh, the, the small farmer feeder is. We can't get those same deals. Uh, they're, they're being offered those. And I agree, some of the best cattle in the country are raised in your state, come from our state of South Dakota and are fed in Iowa. And they do the cash trade and they are shouldering the burden for everybody else. Uh, all of those AMAs are set on a base price. So if they're getting it up in the market, if the base price was higher, then those AMAs may not look like quite so much. The whole base price, the whole of the uh, fat cattle industry would get more. Thank you for the question. Uh, Dr. Tanzer, in your testimony, you recognize the importance of reliable, accessible, and timely market information. Iowa cattle producers that I've talked to believe that the lack of cash trade in other regions and limited information reported due to confidentiality guidelines impede their ability to make well-informed marketing decisions. How can we make cattle market work more efficiently so that the small Iowa producer can compete? Would more transparency and agreements help independent cattle producers get a fair price? That's my last question. Thank you. So in my written testimony, I saved you from it today because I only had five minutes in the oral, I outlined several candidate adjustments to LMR. My short response is, please look at that list. Some of them get at the heart of, we can't tell as an analyst at the moment, how similar cattle quality are on formula versus say negotiated. And in many ways that's because the formula bucket is a catch-all the way it's currently operated. So I think part of the honest answer to that is we need to pause and say, can we gather more information in a reasonable way that makes sense from an economist benefit cost perspective of doing so to understand the differences in the type of cattle, the relationships and so forth. If those prices are very similar, once we account for differences in the cattle and the relationships, that's one thing. If they're not, that's a different thing. And we don't know until we understand more what's in that broader bucket. Currently, the formula is a catch-all bucket the way it operates. So you'll find in my submitted testimony is an encouragement of looking at that. 
The second part, briefly, would be currently USDA reports ranges, min and max. I think there's an opportunity to report more on the price distribution. So the example I used in my written testimony was maybe the 15th and 85th percentile. Let's understand more about the distribution of prices, help both buyers and sellers. We're honing in on the seller perspective here at the moment. I get that. Gather more information on that whole distribution. Some things like that are fairly feasible, in my opinion, given how things already work, if we could ask AMS to work with us to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Grassi. Uh, we'll turn to Senator Smith, who I believe is worth, with us virtually, and then it will be Senator Thune and Senator Fisher. Senator Smith. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you for this hearing and to all of our witnesses for being with us today. Um, so cattle producers in Minnesota tell me that they feel squeezed by this marketplace. The lack of transparency and competition means that cattle producers are making pennies on the dollar in some cases. And meanwhile, consumers are paying more and more for beef while the big processors, which control, um, as Senator Booker said, over 80 percent of the market are seeing soaring profits. Um, this imbalance in the market is exactly why Senator Rounds and I uh, led a bipartisan and bicameral letter asking Attorney General Garland to investigate these anti-competitive practices um, in the marketplace. I also just want to thank Senator Klobuchar, who has um, uh, shown important leadership on this issue as well. I mean, I think that we do have a market concentration problem, and certainly the experiences of Minnesota cow producers, uh, cow producers, cow calf operations really bear that out. Um, I want to just note, I appreciated Dr. Hendricks and what you said a bit ago um, in response to Senator Booker's questions about how diversity um, uh, contributes to more strength, more resilience, and more fairness in the in the market, and um, I certainly see that um, in the experience of, um, of um, the ag sector of Minnesota. I want to ask a question uh, uh, with a little bit of a different angle, and I'm going to direct it to Dr. Um, Hendrickson and also Dr. Heron, uh, Heron. Pardon me, I'd love to know your take on this. It's hard for folks to make a living raising livestock, but it's especially hard for beginning farmers and farmers of color. Um, cattle producers are not just dealing with market concentration and the power of the big meat packers, but also they've got issues with land prices and hay prices and the general cost of living, which keeps on going up and up. So the rising input costs make it especially hard for farm families that are just starting out because um, they just don't have a lot of built-in equity. And then on top of that, you've got the shortage of processing capacity for smaller, you know, smaller processing facilities, and that becomes a real problem for beginning farmers and farmers of color. So Dr. Henderson, let me start with you. Would you like to comment on this and what you see is the relationship between this concentration on the one hand and then the challenges that small farmers, excuse me, beginning farmers and especially farmers of color have uh, breaking in? Thank you, Senator Thank Smith. You. Um, I think one of the big problems we have in the food system today that it's very capital intensive. And it is very difficult for those without capital to figure out a way to participate. And it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we can do things that are less capital intensive. I know that a lot of folks have been talking about, you know, building processing plants and so on. That's, that's pretty capital intensive. So we've got to figure out ways to help people that don't have access to capital um, to, get some, to get a part of that. Um, but one of the ways to do that I think, is to um, do things cooperatively, to do things collectively. And we have a long history in agriculture of where we uh, uh, cooperatively work together, we, c we can make a lot of changes. And so for beginning farmers, um, the farmers of color who have been marginalized in so many different ways, and particularly in access to capital, um, I think that we really have to help those collective strategies uh, uh, help them work together to access markets and to think about things in new ways. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Heron, would you like to comment on this? You were here um, re you know, representing sort of the financial sector. Could you talk a little bit about how the current cattle market has impacted new farmers and what banks can do uh, to help um, new farmers and 
uh, farmers of color who um, historically have challenges re getting access to capital, um, you know, how, how they can be assisted. Certainly. So my role within the bank is to really be a, a source of knowledge. I have colleagues in, in different sectors all across agriculture and all across the world and really try to engage in, in information sharing and helping producers to identify potential new bar markets, help them build new business models. You know, as is, it's been alluded to today several times, consumers are more and more interested about where their food comes from. There's more and more interest in production practices and sustainability. And there are, are several of my peers who have gone back to their family operations and added a component of um, a different kind of more of a niche market to maybe their family's operation or maybe started something brand new on their own, you know, being more engaged with the consumer and really helping to identify, you know, trends in, in the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Thune. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Tupper, help me understand a little bit here. Um, you've heard some of the, your colleagues on the panel today talk about the prices are being um, simply a function of supply and demand. I think I heard you say that the livestock producer, in many cases, is generating a margin of maybe 1%, and that packers were generating margins of 80%. Uh, I think that was, if I heard you right, in your, in your opening remarks. So if you've got a, a supply, a food chain, a food chain that consists of a producer, uh, maybe in our part of the country, uh, it goes to a feeder, but to a processor, ultimately to a retailer and to the consumer. The consumer is paying, I think has been pointed out, kind of record high prices. And um, the producer is going out of business, which means that the profitability in the middle of that food chain is is hardly evenly distributed at all. Now, if there is a, a true market, supply chain, uh, supply and demand uh, regulating this, you would think that there would be some benefit that would accrue to the folks who are in that supply chain, um, and maybe at the end of the supply chain or the start of it, however you want to look at it, and, and that's the producer. So could you just respond to the whole uh, question, or I should say answer that has been given by some on the panel to the, ex the explanation for prices that this is simply a function of supply and demand. Absolutely, and I, I think you alluded to it in, the, in your question that it, it, it really boils down to competition. When they don't have to compete, we can talk about shackle space and they can bring that up. That definitely is a factor because then they can control it. They can control the chain speed. They control the price out the back door. Was there pricing the meat? Uh, so, so the margins can be very disproportionate, and I don't disagree that there are cycles. But as we look back through the history of uh, the cycles, how many farms and ranches and how many small feedlots do we have to lose every time we go through a cycle because it's just another cycle? And through that cycle, the big four corporate packers get filthy rich, and we squeeze out the small guy. And time after time, if you look through history, we have squeezed out the smaller guy. And bigger is not always better. And efficiencies are not always, shouldn't always be given up for competition. And I think that's some of the things that get overlooked. So for a free market to work, um, you have to have competition. And from what I hear you saying, you think if you're, so I'm trying to figure out, if we're trying to come up with solutions and answers to what's happening out there, this volatility in the cattle market, uh, these huge spreads that the packers continue to get that are driving producers at the producer level out of business. Um, how do we fix that? It sounds like what I hear you saying is that there, there is a virtual monopoly. You called an oligopoly, but virtual monopoly. And there's a choke point there where uh, there isn't enough competition. So even though you have huge demand by the consumer and you have adequate supply at the producer level, that's not making it through the food chain in a way that, that saves the consumer any money. So let me ask you a second question, because you've mentioned something about having a second bidder. Talk to me in your business what that means, how that works. 
Without question, in, in the, when we have calf sales, especially in the fall, is a big time. Uh, many of our cattle uh, move through South Dakota to Eastern South Dakota, Nebraska, or Kansas, and we have to have that second bidder to decide what that price may be. Uh, I can tell you as a sale barn owner, when we have one of these black swan events, it affects us directly too. If it's on a Friday at two o'clock and I have 6,000 ball and calves at my sale barn and everybody's uh, running scared because we have another black swan event, that falls on our shoulders as auction market owners to make sure that that market stays at a good place. So it, the only way, in my opinion, that you can have any true price discovery is you have to have a second bidder. You talk to any of these small or medium sized feed lots that do not have already an arrangement with a packer, they do not get a second bidder and they can't get one. And they tell them that you have to take this bid because that otherwise there isn't a chain or a shackle space for you. So here it is. Or you can turn them in on the grid. We're not going to tell you what that price is until next Monday. So I think the key, real key that doesn't get looked at or analyzed is, is that the market power that the big four packers has dictates and controls the profitability through the whole sector. Well, and if you don't have, if I might add, if you don't have a second bidder, you don't have competition, right? So you've got a, a single buyer setting a price, and in this case, a price that is making huge profits for one of those, uh, one of those um, rungs in the food chain, if you will, uh, at the expense of others, and, and particularly the person who's putting the time and the effort and the energy and the work into raising that, uh, that animal in the first place. Is that a fair assessment? I, I think you're spot on in that assessment, Senator. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, my time's expired, but I, I would suggest that we have to figure out um, as part of our deliberations, and whether that's in the form of legislation or working with the Department of Justice, to address this issue of lack of competition and the fact that there is an oligopoly um, and, then, and that price setting and market power is being misused in a way that disadvantages the very people that are, that are out there trying to, uh, to make a living on the land. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, yes, we've got work to do. Uh, Senator Fisher and then Senator Heismith. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing. Before I begin, I'd like to request that Nebraska Cattlemen's testimony highlighting their concerns regarding the thinning levels of price discovery, lack of processing capacity, and the need to increase market transparency be added to the record. So order without objection. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying that I'm not claiming or arguing that more cash sales will improve prices for producers. I am concerned with price discovery and I am concerned with market transparency. Many witnesses mentioned supply and demand impacts on the supply chain, the cattle market and sector profitability. I've spent over 40 years on a ranch in the sand hills of Nebraska. I experienced firsthand the drought changes in herd size, and I saw smaller regional packing facilities being shuttered around us. I understand the shift in the industry that occurred after 2016 and how we find ourselves with more fat cattle and less shackle space. I also understand that no one could have predicted Holcomb or COVID-19. Mr. Tupper, I thank you for your testimony. I love your points on the second bidder. I love your points about the cow-calf producer getting squeezed, uh, but you left out our great Nebraska beef. Mr. Gardner and Mr. Tonser, Dr. Tonser, I appreciate your testimonies. In Nebraska, I represent every segment of the supply chain, cow-calf operations, backgrounders, feed yards of every size. We have packers of every size, including three of the big four. I understand that every region is different. What works in one state might not work in another. So I see the merit in AMAs. I understand why they may be more popular in certain regions. I understand they provide greater economic returns as well as operational efficiencies, both for packers and for feed yards. In fact, that is why I've included a contract library in my legislation to provide all producers who want to diversify their marketing 
but who were not lucky enough to have a seat at the t negotiating table that Mr. Gardner references in his testimony, and they can then have access to examples of what already exists in the marketplace. Dr. Tanzer, as the economist on the panel, I'm interested in your opinion on Mr. Gardner's testimony where he states that his customers on average have earned $92.71 per head in premiums above live-based market price because of his use of a value-based system. Later in the testimony, he states that cash trades can be interpreted as the base price. If there were no publicly reported cash price, for Mr. Gardner to use as his base, he would not be able to determine that his cattle are worth that $92 more per head than his neighbor's cattle. Base price is important. Dr. Tanzer, you highlight the value of AMAs to market participants who choose to utilize them. So how do you foresee these market participants setting the base price for these agreements in the future if the pool of cash participants continues to shrink. So thank you for the comment and questions. Uh, two things come to mind. W one is I think we honestly need to, as I noted also in my written testimony, assess if LMR can help us with the discovery and reporting and transparency component. That in itself isn't changing the percentages that are negotiated, right? I think that has to be kept in mind as well. Not that I have the magic list, but there's some potential helping points there. The second part would be is, and other testimony alluded to, there's other industries that have similar shocks, right, lumber industry and so forth, but I encourage us to go a little bit further also. There's a lot of other industries that have changed what their base way of doing business is. I don't think we're to that point tomorrow, so please don't overreact to my comment, but there's a lot of other sectors in ag to where the base that's used in how you do business is different today than it was 30 or 50 years ago. I encourage us to look forward as opposed to backwards. I use that phrase in my oral testimony for a reason. At some point, I think the industry will use a different base. I think it makes sense the best we can to keep spot negotiated, report it transparently and the like, but we need to also be open to if there's ways to discover value for a commodity in a different way over time, we need to be open to that. And there's other sectors in ag that have done that. We're not gonna do that tomorrow on fed cattle, but I encourage us to at least be aware of that evolution that's existed. Well, I'd be interested to know how you would uh, determine base in the future, because I think the cash sales are important. They, um, they provide information to those using AMAs. I don't think that they, um, they are um, receiving the value that they have, the economic value that they have in the system that we currently have, but they are important to be able to know what the market price is, what the, uh, to be, have that transparency, the accountability in a system that should be benefiting every segment of this industry, from cow-calf producers to my neighbors in South Dakota, close to the sand hills, to be able to have that across the board. We need every segment of this industry to be able to succeed. So My time has expired, but I thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Senator Hyde-Smith. Thank you, Chairman Stabenow, and thank you, Ranking Member Bozeman. I am thrilled that we are having this hearing today. I have been so excited looking forward to this, and I want to thank our panel of witnesses for being here. and. Uh, you know, I'm pleased that the committee has decided that we need to discuss price manipulation, collusion, restrictions of competition, and other unfair practices in the cattle market. I applaud American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duval for establishing a cattle market working group in April 2020 to investigate and research the volatile activities in the, calf, in the cattle markets and the findings and suggested that resulted from that working group's research are quite informative and it should be taken into consideration. What we've been seeing in the cattle markets, rock bottom prices for fed cattle, yet sky high prices for box beef, just defies the basic laws of economics, supply and demand, and we need some solutions. We need some solutions and we need some answers and we need to act upon this. Being a producer myself, as well as a family that operates a stockyard that has had a live cattle auction since 1942, 
I'm getting hundreds of calls from producers, from beef cattle producers that are saying, Cindy, what is wrong with this market? They are seeing their prices they're getting and they're seeing what the prices are at the grocery store and that bo with box beef. Several of my colleagues have put forth legislation that will require USDA to establish a minimum mandatory negotiated trade in the cash markets by the packers. We have talked about many things, but I have never seen so many producers give me calls. They are busy. Right now, they're in fields all across America cutting hay, baling hay, getting ready to put it in the farm, in the barn for winter, so they can feed their cattle. My 87-year-old father-in-law, I assure you, is fixing fence right now today somewhere because we are protecting our herd. We have got to be the voice to protect this industry. Mr. Tupper, your fellow panelists here, they seem to suggest that the AMAs are the solution to low prices being paid to producers. Tell me how an alternative marketing agreement between a feeder and a packer will benefit a cow calf producer who unloads a gooseneck load of tra trailer load at your barn every week. How would that benefit that producer? It won't. You know, in short, um, th there's no question that, that there can be some value and, and we need to make sure that we get a good product out there, but there are other ways to do it than just an AMA. Well, I want to be here because these producers can't be here and they know exactly what you just said. They know that. They don't have a seat at this table. Farm Bureau was not asked to be a panelist today as I requested, but I assure you their chair at this table is not empty because I'm sitting in it. Should this committee continue further discussions on the legislative proposals in hopes of finding legislative solutions to bring greater price transparency to the market, Mr. Tupper? Absolutely. We, we, we need to know, uh, and, and one of the big things, the big elephant in the room when you talk to these big feeders, the corporate feeder does not want you to know what price they get versus what price I get when I sell my fat cattle from my feedlot in Nebraska. So I, I am going to throw in the Nebraska section, but they, they don't want to know the differences that that may be, what, what I can get versus what they can get. We have a lot of customers, you and I, and they're being treated very unfairly right now, and I think that it is time for that to stop. My second question is for Dr. Tonser. I have a little bit of time left. When an August 2019 fire knocked out one of the largest beef processing facilities in the country in Holcomb, Texas, and boy, I remember the day watching it on national news and that smoke bellowing out, cattle prices collapsed while wholesale beef prices rose 12% in a week. In seven days, wholesale beef prices rose 12%. During the COVID pandemic, the same trends were amplified and the effect was more widespread. At the height of the pandemic, wholesale beef prices were more than double the previous years, but those gains were never experienced on a rancher's level. We're available risk management, were available risk management tools sufficient for ranchers to manage their risk during these highly volatile events that we didn't expect? Pardon me. So I don't, I'm not aware of a risk management tool against a fire at a plant if you're a producer, right? Because that's a market access thing for something I sell. I'm not aware of a tool that would be there for that. To answer the question, there are risk management tools for somebody that sells fed cattle or feeder cattle for just general price movement, whether that is a traditional hedge using CME products, whether it is a USDA life, life, livestock excuse me, insurance product or the like. Those tools do exist. Um, that's probably a whole other separate discussion for a day, but none of them are specific to a fire or a loss of packing capacity specifically. Well, I'm out of time, and I pre appreciate your answers, and I hope we have another round because I have a lot more questions. Thank you very much, Senator Hyde-Smith. Um, Senator Ernst is next, and then Senator Hoven and Senator Braun. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to our witnesses today. And Dr. Tonser, um, like you, I grew up 
feeding hogs and walking beans, and those are the typical things us farm kids do uh, on our family farms. Um, I, of course, grew up in southwest Iowa, and I experienced firsthand the hard work that goes into production agriculture. Agriculture has long been uh, the bedrock of our national economy, and Iowa certainly plays a critical part in ensuring folks have access to a safe and affordable food supply. And without transparency, we risk losing that fair competitive pricing. Uh, what would you recommend to achieve greater transparency in the market? And how can we send, or how can the market send clearer signals to both our producers and our end consumers? So my response would be similar to what I've given a couple times, is I would encourage ongoing looking at how LMR works, and there's always room for improvement. Some of the things in my written testimony are easier, closer to the no-brainer kind of edge on that continuum. Others need further assessment. Uh, I made the comment about formula transactions being kind of a catch-all category. Um, I think there's room to potentially gather information better so we understand what that is a little bit more. Uh, I can't sit here and tell you more without additional information coming back out. Um, that's my best response is to pause. And there are periodic reviews of LMR. LMR has been around for 20 years. It's reauthorized roughly every five years. Part of what happens is looking at how that works. I would encourage us to seriously think about that and make sure we are to the best we're able to while protecting confidentiality. That's embedded in my submission as well. I think that's important to keep in mind. Uh, providing as much information on the market as we can. I think there's ways to do that without mandates on certain percent cash negotiated and so forth. That's embedded in several of my responses that have come up today. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. And and Mr. Tupper, I'm going to turn to you. Um, my mother worked at a livestock auction when I was a young girl. She was not an auctioneer, uh, but certainly um, every Wednesday afternoon she kept the books for uh, the folks in Stanton, Iowa. And as one day a week, us kids didn't have to ride the school bus home. So we, we loved it. Uh, but over the past 20 years, we really have seen a drastic shift in purchase agreements. And 20 20 years ago, over half of all cattle were traded on a negotiated basis. And today, negotiated purchases account for just a quarter of all purchases. Instead, alternative arrangements like formula or forward contracts have become more prevalent. Formula transactions are less transparent because they, are, uh, they utilize base prices that are not publicly disclosed or reported. As a producer, can you accurately describe what is used to set the base price in these formulas? And then would knowing the base price and any premiums be advantageous for cattlemen? Yes, and thank you for the question, Senator, and uh, appreciate those, uh, on, as an auctioneer, we appreciate those secretaries. That's what keeps yes. us in line. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the base price is generally sent in most of those AMAs, and there's different, very many different ones, and you said it. There are very many different categories to that, so we don't know exactly what some of those are, but the five-state weighted average is often used as the base price. So, uh, as the packer can buy less than, as Senator Grassley pointed out, 20% in the spot cash market and use that to set the base price for 80% of the cattle that are sold in these AMAs. And then he can tell those guys that are getting AMAs, like Mr. Gardner has alluded to in his testimony, that you make 80 or $90 a head. That's quite a significant move for the packer. They absolutely can control the base price and then give a little incentives to a few of the cattle and then keep the rest of the cattle at that base price level. So uh, I think when, when we set those base prices, that's where the bar has to get higher. We, we, we have a great product. Uh, we definitely need to segregate. I don't disagree that, that uh, the better cattle and the better breeding and all the things that are put into that need to be rewarded, but I think there's other ways to do it than just AMAs. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I thank all of our witnesses for being here today. This is a tough issue, I think, for so many of us. Um, so uh, hearing all different sides um, coming together, uh, certainly we hope to be able to sort through this and, and figure a way forward. Um, certainly, Madam Chair, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Senator Hoven. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Tonser, uh, bock beef prices uh, continue to rise as we've talked, as we've discussed here, live cattle prices are struggling to reach pre-pandemic levels. In your opinion, why is that? So in my opinion, consistent with other peer-reviewed research, is when you have the shocks we've had, we would expect beef prices to go up and fed cattle prices to go down. That is what we've seen. The magnitude of what we've experienced stands out, and in many ways that's because the life experience that I hope we're on the end of has been very unique. That would be my short response. Would reducing concentration in the meatpacking sector alleviate that trend? So you're getting Tonzer's opinion. That's why I was asked here, so as long as I remind you, that's okay. There's an important difference between price discovery and price level. If you erode concentration in the spirit of more smaller facilities, maybe, and please note I said maybe, you help with some price discovery issues. I think it depends on what else we do around that discussion. But I also think you give up a lot of known economic benefits. Depending on how far you go with that argument, you're going to squeeze out actually, you're going to shrink the size of the industry because the beef cattle industry will be less efficient. I'm not hiding the fact I noted the evolution of the industry was because of efficiencies. If you lose those efficiencies, you end up with a smaller industry. What changes should be made to the livestock mandatory reporting to improve pricing and transparency? What changes should be made? So I cannot tell you one that has to be made. I think that's outside my wheelhouse. My written testimony listed out some that need serious assessment. Some that I think are easier to implement without giving up much is things like adding information on the distribution of prices. I think speaking to not just the min, max, the range, but 15th, 18th percentile can add information to those that are wanting information to negotiate differently or to understand the cattle type value and so forth. Those are fairly easy. So those are the ones I'm most comfortable saying, quote, unquote, should. There's other ones that require changes in how the data is collected. So I made the comment earlier for a different senator is currently we have whole state aggregation. So the way the data is reported, we know if that transaction was in Nebraska or Kansas or not. Uh, potentially refining that would allow us to examine other ways to report that might help. But please note, I said potentially and might as I'm working through this continuum. There's several things that need to be evaluated. Some of these I'm more comfortable advocating for. I don't even like advocating for, I'm just more comfortable they can be done without adverse impact. Others need to be examined more. Do you think changes need to be made? I think some would be beneficial without substantial cost. And if they fall in that bucket, then I would say yes. So uh, for Mr. Gardner and, and Mr. Tupper, you both noted the importance of price discovery in your testimony, but you disagree on how best to ensure adequate levels of cash trade to support that price discovery in the cattle market. How should we balance a producer's ability to use alternative marketing arrangements with the need to protect and improve price discovery? What do we do? I'll tackle that first. To, to me, one of the very first things we have to do is know what those are. The contract library, library that Senator Fisher alluded to would be huge. That way we know what those are. We may not know exactly what they are. Uh, so I think one of the, the, the biggest ways we can do that is make sure we understand what the equal playing field is and not just the big corporate feeders or the ones that have uh, arrangements with certain packers that all their cattle go there can get that price uh, that the, the smaller feeder can get the same. So would all prices, what prices would go to that library? All prices? Your mic, sir. Excuse me. One of the things uh, now that is not reported is what those ups might be. Uh, we, we don't get to know necessarily in price reporting what uh, one of those uh, contracts that they may have or one of their exclusives that they may have to those. And a contract library, if written correctly, because we have a contract library in hogs, so we have something to work from, and we, there are some problems there, and I think we can work through those. Then we can find out what all of those market uh, contracts are and what the true price that some are getting for those cattle are. Including the AMAs? Including the AMAs, yes. Okay. Uh, and then, well, I guess, again, any other changes, but that, that you would recommend the library. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so I had that for both uh, Gardner and Tupper. How, uh, what, what other changes, any other changes to the uh, AMA? Senator, may I speak? Yep. Yes, sir. 
I stated in my testimony, in my written testimony, I think all of these things need to be included in there. And the, the confidentiality has caused that to not be there. But I think the base price is the base price, just as I stated with wheat. And so if we do have that transparency and we do have that there, then it's going to be a more robust price discovery. I will get disagreement as I have all afternoon, but I would suggest to you if there was not a single AMA or a single formula, and again, like Dr. Tonger said, this is Mark Gardner's opinion, our price today on fed cattle would be the same. So I'm all about robust, transparent, put everything into what creates this best base price, and that will allow us to hit these targets. Mandates, and I mean, one of the things that I think about in this whole discussion as we talk amongst producers and discuss, this angst, this discussion, this uh, worry that we all see in all of our families and our customers and, and just the whole industry will lead us to a better place. I'm asking that the industry go there and not be mandated because you look back to these niche market processors. I mean, I'm a niche market producer. We designed U.S. premium beef because we wanted to fit the niche to be able to reward it for the things that we did. So I happen to agree with Justin Tupper that I think all these things be disclosed will have a more robust price discovery, but I don't want to be inhibited on extra options. Thank, thank you. you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I went over my time, but thank you for the indulgence. All right. Madam Chair, could I um, yes, submit Madam for the Bill. record, I have uh, received uh, input and consulted with South Dakota Stock Growers and South Dakota Cattlemen's Association. They've submitted statements. I'd like to submit those for the record if there's no objection. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Senator Braun. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to take a little different angle because there's no doubt about it, the more transparency you have in anything, uh, along with uh, options, uh, many people wanting to buy what you produce, and uh, that's how you get to where I think markets really work. There shouldn't be barriers to entry. You should have full transparency, but you have to have enough entities on the buying end because then you turn into what's called an oligopoly to where they game the system. And what I'm afraid of is we've already gotten there. Um, I've been the loudest voice trying to reform health care. Uh, when you end up with only three hospitals in a market, I don't care how, I'm gonna, we're going to go after transparency. I think it would help there because there's zero in that place of our economy where it costs us 20% of our GDP, and we never know what it costs us until we get our bill in the mail and open it up with trepidation. So I think that's an issue along with all the other things I mentioned. I want to look at the input side. Uh, often, you know, you've got issues with selling your product where you've got robust competition for it with transparency. Um, my question would be for Mr. Tupper and then for uh, Mr. Gardner. Uh, corn, soybeans, I deal with several of them on land that I rent to farmers, and they complain to me about all of a sudden when corn goes up to 550, inputs follow right along. And you're not dealing necessarily with more acres. You just got, again, the folks that you buy seed corn from, that you buy herbicides from, pesticides. It's not as broad a selection as you had 15 to 20 years ago when corn and soybeans cost maybe one-third in variable inputs what it costs now. Do you on your own farm, Mr. Tepper, grow um, silage to feed to your cattle? Uh, and, or is that something you buy on the market, your corn that would go into silage? For myself, we purchase most of that. Cost. And that is another way when you're looking at uh, ways to avoid markets that aren't giving you choices on your inputs. Um, there, at least, if you had ways to avoid uh, inputs going up, do you have, have you had inputs go up on other things you need to fatten out your cattle? Has that gone up or does it stay steady? Do you view that side of the equation as something where you've got choice and transparency as well? 
I think uh, we've seen exactly how you explained it. All those input costs have gone up. And, and one thing that happens in the ranching sector, uh, when, when they see the rancher being money, I alluded to in my testimony, give money to the rancher, they'll spend it faster than anybody. So uh, the, 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 the costs go up in rent, just like you alluded to, and, and it never seems to fail. Our costs would go up in seed costs and, and, and all through the sector. So it's getting squeezed on both sides of the equation. You've got more concentration, fewer options on selling what you produce, and fewer options to control your input costs along the journey as well. Uh, Mr. Gardner, would you want to weigh in on that uh, also? Well, I think that's uh, it's all true. We raise wheat leach here and, and put that up, but our costs skyrocket too. Uh, when corn goes up, you know, that that adds cost to all of our feedstuffs and all of our inputs. Uh, and at the risk of sounding like an economist, I mean, it's supply and demand. The reason that, that corn has gone up is because there was less of a supply and a worldwide demand. And I think that's a good thing for corn farmers. And at the same time, uh, all these other input costs, I mean, that's part of the risk management. That's part of the supply alignment to hit consumer markets that have more value. I mean, we're actually lots of us saying the same thing in different ways. All I want is the opportunity to be able to compete and know what those targets are. And when we do that, and I think Justin's saying the same thing, if we have this robust price discovery, true supply and demand will go forward. Thank and you. I, and I think the difference there, because uh, I'm about out of time, is the fact that your corn and soybeans, you're dealing with generally the same number of acres, give or take, that are produced. Uh, seed corn and all the inputs and things that go into that side of it, uh, just because the price of corn goes up because you've got a short supply, doesn't mean that the underlying it input sh should. And what's happening across not only agriculture, it's happening across many other industries, we're no longer the markets that we used to have where it's full transparency, many participants in it, robust competition, and you end up with oligopolies, monopolies, high prices, and if you're at the bottom of the food chain, you pay the consequences of it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Because of the interest of uh, members who still so remain, we, we are going to uh, allow another round of questions. If you are interested in doing it, if someone has a question uh, or two, um, and um, I think uh, at this point, the only thing I would like to ask uh, uh, is um, uh, Dr. Hendrickson, if there's anything further uh, that you would like to share with us as it relates to uh, resiliency and uh, what what we've talked about today and where your focus would be in addressing these issues. Thank you, Senator Stabenow. I actually think one of the things that we've overlooked is the power issue here and the power that comes with being able to control decision making in the food, in the food system. So right now, those decisions are often controlled within the boards of directors, within the managers of these large food firms. And it's not just in the meatpacking industry. It's within, it's within the uh, supermarkets like Walmart. It's, in the, it's within um, the uh, corn traders that Senator Braun was re, uh, talking about, like Cargill and, and um, Amadium. But this power of the decision making is something that has to be addressed if we're going to have the ability to implement a diverse number of options, um, people uh, nimbleness in the food supply chain so that people can respond in their particular place. And I would also emphasize the importance of the impact this has on people. And we've talked a lot about, well, the industry may be smaller or larger. Um, we, we've talked about um, you know, uh, supply and demand, but we're really not talking about what is the impact on people, their communities, and their ecologies. And I think we have to keep that impact on people, farmers, workers, 
consumers, we have to keep that impact on people front and center. And people need to be able to make decisions about their food. Um, farmers need to be able to make decisions about where they're going to buy and where they're going to sell. And that, that decentralization is absolutely imperative if we're going to have a resilient food supply chain. Thank you very much. Uh, we have with us uh, Senator Bozeman. I don't know if, if you would like to ask a question. Just very, very quickly. Um, first of all, thank all of you for being here, either here or virtual. Uh, this really has been a good discussion and a discussion that we need to have. And, and uh, again, ongoing talks in the future. Um, it sounds like we've got some consensus in regard to uh, transparency. Uh, things like contract libraries, again, understanding price distribution, uh, those kind of things. Mr. Tupper, you mentioned that, that there might be other tools that can be utilized to pay for quality aside from the AMAs. Uh, have you got any ideas in that regard? I do. It used to be when I was a, a kid and we sold fat cattle, there was four or five buyers would walk on your yard and they would walk through the cattle and they would assess those cattle and they would bid you a price according not only to the market, but according to those cattle. And one thing I can remember as a kid, uh, a term that used to come out at the sale barn, they called it grade and steel. And, 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 and I reflect back to that because this is what we're trying to do now. Mr. Gardner alluded to, we want to raise a high quality beef and we want to get paid for that. And I do not disagree with that. And I don't want to sound like I do. But I, what I'm saying is there's very many ways to do it. They talk about efficiency. So many times today, the packer does not even send a buyer out to any of those feed yards, especially the smaller ones. They never even get a buyer to come out. So the, the, because of efficiencies, they've eliminated those people they needed, the big four packers, so they don't have to send them out. They already don't compete against each other, so if they come to uh, Senator Hydesmith's yard, and th they're only going to see one buyer. And for some reason, they've drew the boundaries. I can't tell you how many producers tell me they can't even get one of the other packers to come bid. And, 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 you know, whether that's been done anti-competitively, how, how do you prove that, I don't know. But that's what I hear out there. So I, I think uh, it's huge that we get that second bidder in the marketplace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll call on Senator Fisher and then Senator Hydesmith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Gardner, I was going to uh, ask you a, a question after uh, Dr. Tanzer uh, completed his, so I'd, I'd like to touch base on one more thing, if I could. In your testimony, uh, you make clear that the preferred route of addressing price discovery is through voluntary programs. You're against um, mandating, and you also cite uh, the ongoing industry efforts. Um, I assume you're you're referring to NCBA's 75% plan. Is that correct? Well, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, I'm certainly aware of that, uh, but I I do want robust, transparent price discovery, and the the question of of mandates. And I mean, who's going to mandate? I mean, if if I have uh, I want to hit these targets. Uh, I mean, who's going to tell me I have to sell cash or I have to sell this other way? I think the unintended consequences have challenges for all of us. And we've talked about it. We need more processing. We need more shackle space. We need more buyers. I agree with all that. The reason they are not there is because if we go back to those times that we all love so much in 2014 and 2015, when we had record high cattle prices, it was because we did not have enough cattle. The cattle supply was there and they needed that to fill that. Those processors are gone from that time period. The growth in capacity today is coming from this increased beef demand. And so when we put all of these things, and I'll just call it a bucket, uh, I mean, if we had a thousand processors and they were all bidding on the cattle, my belief, and I'll say it's my personal belief, the fed cattle price today would be the same. And so if we have that there transparent for everybody to see, 
And then we let the industry come together and solve these indus uh, these arrangements to solve this price discovery. Then I we're not mandated. Yeah. So I know, appreciate the opportunity. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I th I thank you for your comments, but the the issue is we don't see voluntary reporting. We um, we don't have that transparency under a voluntary method with. Uh, with that 75% plan, there were many states that didn't, um, didn't make the, the cut in the first quarter on it. So that, that's the issue in trying to keep everything voluntary. And I, I think when you compare you know, what many of us are trying to do on this committee to have uh, that transparency, to have to have the information available to all producers so they can make wise market decisions, uh, it's, it's not going to happen on a voluntary Senator, basis. So Senator, thank, thank you. I'm saying, I appreciate your comment. I would like to, to clarify that. I'm saying put all of this in mandatory price reporting for full disclosure. I, I, voluntary, uh, I do not believe is going to you know, it, it has proven so far it's not working. Yeah. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, Senator Hyde Smith. <clears throat> Thank you, Ranking Member Bozeman. And again, today's been so helpful, it really has. And no one is out to destroy any company, any industry. The Packers are very vital in our industry, and we realize that. We just are so appreciative of the panel and hopefully maybe coming to some solutions now that uh, we've had this hearing. My uh, third question is for Mr. Tupper again, because we're talking about the livestock mandatory reporting. And with the authorization for the livestock mandatory reporting set to expire at the end of this September, what is the case to be made for including formula-based pricing in the reporting just as current negotiated cash trade? And would this additional information be beneficial for producers as they strive for more information into the cattle markets, as Senator Fisher has alluded to? Uh, I think it would be more beneficial. I think the one thing, and, and this is going to be real layman's terms here, confidentiality kills LMR. When, when, when we can't see because there isn't, and here's the key, there isn't enough participants in the market, we can't report it. The, the trouble with that is in a fat cattle market today, everybody with iPhones, and you and I know this in the marketplace, if somebody's bidding $1.26, which I got texted this morning for fat cattle, everybody in the industry knows it. So this confidentiality rule that they fall back on 30, uh, 37020, thank you, Mr. Tonzer, uh, does not fit the, for this industry. And, and I understand it, and, and I've been told every time we go to USDA, I get shot backwards because I throw up all over confidentiality. But we, that's one of the big things. We can't get it all in there. Thank you. And I have a question for Dr. Hendrickson. In April and May of 2020, you know, we saw the grocery stores, just the shelves that were barren, and uh, store meat cases in portions of our country, meat packing plants at a standstill due to the COVID, and uh, a backup of fed cattle that could not be processed because the people just weren't there to be able to process that. While larger, more efficient packing plants allow for more daily production of meat, can a case be made for directing more funding to smaller independent and regional packing facilities to reinforce their role in our supply chains so we will not experience the grocery store shelves to be completely empty like we experienced in that totally unprecedented pandemic. Thank you, Senator Hyde-Smith. I think that building up more forms of capacity in the in beef packing and other parts of the food system is absolutely critical. And it's to, it, we don't want this everything concentrated in one node. We need to have multiple nodes and multiple connectivity between nodes um, in order for us to be more resilient and nimble in responding to something like the pandemic. So I think that supporting new kinds of capacity um, at, 
at different levels. Like right now, we don't have anybody between those who can process maybe you know, 80 or 90 cattle a day and people that are, you know, doing 5,000 or more a day. With that, that middle is missing, and I think that um, trying to reinforce and build that up is really important. Thank you. And uh, for Mark Gardner, some time ago, USDA, they consolidated GIPSA under the mission area of the USDA Agriculture Marketing Service. Do you as panelists believe this move has limited the agency's ability to investigate any level of the market manipulation in the beef industry? And what level of collaboration do you believe there should be between USDA and the Department of Justice? Senator, I don't feel I'm qualified to answer that, so I'm not going to conjecture. Is there any panelists that would like to address that? Okay, it'll go unanswered. I don't either. <laughs> Good job. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My time has expired. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our witnesses. Um, uh, as you can see, there's no sh shortage of uh, questions on these issues. It's, it's very, very important. We, we appreciate your testimony. There is clearly a need for greater transparency and competition in the marketplace, uh, and we... Uh, need to make sure that livestock producers of all sizes have options, both in normal times and during unprecedented times like we've seen in the last 18 months. Uh, as I've said when we started today, we need to keep exploring ways to make our livestock supply chain and our food supply chain as a whole more resilient. Reacting to specific events, whether it's a pandemic or a hack or extreme weather, isn't enough. Uh, we need to build a food supply chain better able to withstand these future disruptions, whatever they are. One thing is certain, we're not done as a committee, and I commit to continuing with colleagues, to work with uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisle to address these important issues going forward. So thank you very much. The hearing is adjourned.
former Minneapolis police